Well, welcome to our closing panel, The Future of Freedom, uh, Where Are We Headed? And I want to start off, we have a very distinguished group of both conservative and libertarian leaders, and I'm delighted to have Morton Blackwell from the Leadership Institute. We have uh, Richard Vigory from American Target, who is really the father of conservative marketing guru, shall we say. We have Steve Forbes, he needs no introduction. We have Governor Gary Johnson, the former governor of New Mexico, very successful man and a candidate for President of the United States in 2012, according to the recent card I, I, uh, I saw. So uh, we'll, we'll forgive you for running for president, which, but maybe, maybe things could change. I'm gonna ask a question in that regard in just a minute. And last but not least, Tom Woods from the Mises Institute. We're delighted to have him here, been here before. Wrote a great book called Meltdown, and uh, it's just great to have you here. So let's just start off right from the beginning. I've been listening to the people, they've been coming up to me and they said, what is it with this universal pessimism here? The, some of the foreigners that I've talked to, and we have a lot of people internationally at Freedom Fest say, we don't have this pessimism. I spoke to some Canadians who say, we've turned our country around. Why can't you turn your country around? So my first question to you is how pessimistic are you? Is there any chance that we can turn things around and freedom can expand? And with that, I should preface, in the Heritage and the Fraser um, Economic Freedom Index, the United States has gradually been dropping uh, from the top levels into the second tier levels. How do we reverse that and move back up? Uh, so, so there's two parts to this question. How pessimistic are you? How optimistic are you? And what can we do to turn things around? Now, given we have only five members here, I only want each one of you to just give some basics. Let's have a lot of interaction. So just take three minutes, each one of you. That's gonna be 15 minutes right there for the first round, just three minutes. Are you an optimist or a pessimist about America? And what, some basic ideas on how we can turn things around. Morton Blackwell, you start. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, I am certainly, at least for the short term, uh, very optimistic. Many people have asked me if I think the remarkable new grassroots and classical uh, liberal activism will continue all the way to the November election. Uh, my answer is simple, yes. Uh, why has this activism developed? Because of citizen rage at the unprecedented number and variety of power grabs by the Obama administration and the Pelosi-Reed Congress. Our nation's seen nothing like this before, not even during the expansions of government in Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal or Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. Political activism now caused by citizen outrage might decline if the leftist power grabs ceased. But Obama, Pelosi, and Reid are ideologues. Their power grabs will continue uh, through the November election, so I fully expect the level of conservative and classical liberal outrage and activism to continue and even grow in intensity. Uh, I do expect a lame duck session of this Congress after the election to continue until the new Congress convenes uh, next January. Nancy Pelosi could probably pass the Communist Manifesto on the floor of the House, so the leftists won't want to waste a minute as long as their uh, congressional majorities last. But I think in the short term, the election results in November will range for us somewhere between excellent and spectacular. Very good. Richard, you are next. Give us your, your comments about the fourth leg of the movement, which you seem to be very enthused about. Uh, I am uh, more optimistic, enthusiastic than I've been in the 50 years I've been involved in politics at the national level. I never saw before how conservatives could come to power, quite frankly. I understood how we could slow the growth of government down with a Reagan presidency, with uh, the Gingrich Revolution of 94, but I never saw how we could actually come to power. And now, for the first time in my life, I see it as a possibility. No guarantees, 
but it is a possibility because of the overreach of President Obama, Democrats, and the Tea Party. Uh, back in the 50s and the 60s, the conservative movement rested on a two-legged stool, which was basically national defense, i.e. anti-communism, and uh, economic issues, smaller government, less taxes, etc. And that would get us 40, 45 percent of the vote, sometimes 48, very seldom 51. With the uh, arrival in the late 70s of the social issues, the social rights, so to speak, now we begin to get 51 percent uh, occasionally. Had uh, three landslide elections for the presidency in the uh, 1980s, the Gingrich Revolution of 94, but we're still not governing America. Now with the arrival of the Tea Party, I see it as a strong possibility that we can turn everything around Save the military. Every major institution in America is arrayed against us. Big business, Wall Street, higher education, lower education, Hollywood, the media, the nonprofit community, organized religion, goes on and on and on. This is a long battle, but I see the possibility for the first time. And let me just say one other thing. Next time Obama does something, which will probably be before the sun sets today, you know, once, twice, three times a day. <laughs> you take 15, max 30 seconds to be upset be angry, throw something, whatever. Then get down on your knees and thank God that he's President of the United States because that is the opportunity we have to save America. We were gonna lose America. It might take 20, 30 years under the Bob Doles, the George Bushes, the uh, John McCain's. We were gonna lose America. Now we have a chance, thanks to people like you and this audience to turn it around. Good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Steve, Steve Forbes, you always have a unique perspective here as our chief number one capitalist at Freedom Fest. Tell us uh, your perspective. Are you an optimist? Are you a pessimist? Or are you something in between? Maybe just a mist, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I won't pursue that. But, uh, but no, I, I'm, I'm an optimist, and I think uh, uh, both of our panelists have uh, very eloquently stated why we have reason for hope. But it underscores the need for the work that we're doing, you're doing, has got to be redoubled, and that is win the battle of ideas. Because winning elections is not winning the battle of ideas. Stopping the growth of the state is not ultimately going to save us from the state. And areas that we have to focus on realize that even though Obama overreached, one of the smart things they did was introduce what you might call neo-socialism. The old socialists thought you had to nationalize everything. No, these guys realize that if you regulate overbearingly, you have effective control, but you have other people doing your work, turn private sectors into vassals, and uh, you achieve the same thing that Marx wanted to do. So the areas where you get true independence, it starts with the US dollar, stable dollar tied to gold. You get rid of this current income tax code, replace it with something like the flat tax on, on social security. Uh, for younger people, bring in a real system of personal accounts, none of this 2% payroll stuff. Go for 8 or 10 or 12% for younger people. And on health care, they assume with these mammoth liability numbers, remember, those numbers assume very little productivity in health care. If we push in a new Congress for things like having nationwide shopping on health care, equal tax treatment, uh, tort reform, removing barriers on health savings accounts and the like, you'll start to get real free enterprise in health care, real productivity, and those uh, liability numbers come crashing down. We don't have to do the convoluted way we do health care forever and ever. And on schools, genuine school choice. If you do those basic things, stable dollar tied to gold, new tax code, new social security system for younger people, private enterprise in health care, and genuine school choice, you've ripped the guts out of the Leviathan. And then we can focus on all of these other things that they do and have a chance to win and not fall in the trap as we have in the past of trying to fight trench warfare against the specific programs here and there. You win a battle, then you get pushed back again. Let's go for the whole thing, get the big things, and win this thing and have the commanding heights so they're on defense for the next several generations. That's excellent. I think, Gary, you could use that as part of your campaign speech. Um, uh, so you were governor for eight years? Eight years. From New Mexico. You turned that state around. Is it possible, is this just pie-in-the-sky uh, 
um, recommendations that Steve Forbes has made. He ran on that platform for president twice and did not get the nomination or the presidency, tragically, but nevertheless, let's be realistic. Is this sort of thing possible, especially given that now, from what everyone's told me, over half the American populace on a net basis depends on the federal government and state governments for their well-being. Have we reached the point of no return, Gary Johnson? I, I think I bring a unique perspective here to all this, and that is, is that I did actually get to serve as governor of New Mexico for eight years, bringing a libertarian perspective to everything it was that I did. Uh, that it was all about a cost-benefit analysis, best product, best service, lowest price. I really said no to billions of dollars worth of spending in New Mexico. I vetoed 750 bills. I had thousands of line item vetoes. New Mexico's two to one Democrat. I got reelected. So what people saw was this notion of treating everybody equally as opposed to favoritism for individuals that were well connected uh, individually, uh, uh, groups. People, people saw this and, and I got reelected. Um, I tell you, what I think right now is, is that there's just an outrage in this country. Uh, that right now the sentiment is, is that everybody that's in office needs to be voted out of office. That's the way that it is right now. And, and, that, and, and because of that outrage, uh, I'm really optimistic. I, I think that Republicans are going to pick up as a result of this phenomenon, but unless they return to the, to the uh, religion of the pocketbook, I don't think Republicans are going to stay in either, and that's a good thing. I, I hope that we keep this sentiment about voting them out if they're not going to address the problems that we have. So I see us, I'm optimistic. I think we're at a precipice here. I think we're at a precipice here, and it's because of what Obama has done. We've seen things pushed further than we've ever seen pushed before. We need to slash spending, Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security. 43 cents out of every dollar that we're currently spending is borrowed. This is insanity. We're bankrupt. But maybe as a result of everybody seeing this, we can actually reform what's happening in this country. And that's what I'm optimistic about. Real free markets when it comes to health care, when it comes to school choice. Real free markets. Looking at our national security. I happen to believe that our national security isn't being threatened in either Iraq or Afghanistan. That we should be out of those. That they should, we should be out of those places, and that isn't to turn our back uh, on national security, but again, the optimism that we might refocus on what this country really is about, which is freedom, liberty, and the personal responsibility that goes along with that. And as governor of New Mexico, I espoused the legalization of marijuana. I always got a kick out of Republicans that would say, freedom, liberty, and the personal responsibility that goes along with that, except for marijuana. <laughs> so. Good look, point. look, right. there's, a, there's a real opportunity here, yeah. and, and I think it's going to happen. Good. Thank you. Bye. I... Good. All right. Now, finally, Tom Woods can give us a perspective from the Mises Institute, which is growing in tremendous influence. We're delighted to have the Mises Institute here for the first time at Freedom Fest. You have a cra crowd of 2,000 people to tell us your perspective uh, what's happening, but let me ask you in particular a question. Gary Johnson said, let's slash some of these welfare programs. Is it even conceivable that anyone could get elected saying we're going to sla slash Social Security and Medicare? Well, it might not be. So we might be in a situation in which the inevitable collapse of these programs, and it is inevitable, this is not a doomsayer talk, the inevitable collapse of these programs will put us in a situation in which all of a sudden, with no preparation, we'll suddenly have to make provision for who knows how many people who will have made no provision for themselves because so many Americans sort of have this kind of almost naive confidence that, well, the experts are in charge, somebody's running things, I'm sure they'll keep everything together. Gosh, we, that's got to be priority number one is to undermine confidence in the experts. It was the experts who got us into the financial crisis, and they're going to make sure Social Security is OK for us. But let me say, I mean, I, I think I may be a bit of an outlier um, here, much as I respect the fellow panelists, and I agree with uh, many of them on many things. But um, I, I feel like, I think we've all heard the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Well, I've got sort of a variation on that. For me, the definition of insanity is believing that if we elect another GOP plastic man, uh, Mitt Romney, I'm looking in your direction, things will be fixed. Well, you know, I mean, how many times? I mean, seriously. 
I'm not even 40 and I'm already tired of this. How many times do we have to be scammed by these scam artists in DC who make a lot of money, who make a lot of money pushing this or that candidate or assembling mailing lists or whatever, but who frankly sit back silently when, let's say, George W. Bush is racking up uh, huge deficits, getting us into all these wars, invading civil liberties, involving the federal government even further in education and pretending this is conservative, saddling us with the Medicare Part D prescription drug plan. And we're supposed to say, oh, good, I feel great because these people are on their way back in or people who are 5% fiscally to the right of them are on the way back in. I don't see what to cheer about that. It just means we'll have a lot more wars, we'll have a lot more military spending, and even experts in the military will tell you that the additional military spending that we're seeing, where we've got these insane Pentagon budgets, translate into fewer, or into less equipment, fewer troops, so it's actually less bang for the bucks, even from a military point of view, just the idea that we gotta just keep, we need a strong defense, therefore throw more money at the Pentagon, please. Anybody who knows the first thing about this knows that, that, in fact, defense readiness is much worse with all the additional money. So even from that point of view, it's a disaster. No, I'm afraid that what we really need is to have a Tea Party that will say, yep, the Democrats are terrible, but so are the Republicans. I've still got the stab marks in my back. <laughs> Tom, thank you. Uh, I thought... Uh, We've had Doug Casey on this uh, uh, panel before, and uh, you, you're an excellent uh, replacement. For our <laughs> <laughs> you're our new Doug Casey. Um, I, I want to briefly mention, we have at this conference uh, leaders from the Fraser Institute from Canada, and I just want to mention very briefly their story, because a couple months ago, I was at the Money Show in Vancouver, and I stopped by, and and said hello to Michael Walker, the founder of the Fraser Institute. And uh, Michael told me a very interesting story. He said in 1995, Canada was facing an incredible financial crisis. Uh, their dollar was sinking. Uh, uh, government as a percent of GDP had reached 53%. Uh, they had all kinds of welfare problems and, and so forth. And uh, so the Fraser Institute had a, a, a big powwow in Toronto, and they invited everybody, the important uh, civic leaders, uh, government leaders, uh, business leaders, at this conference. They brought up John Fund from the Wall Street Journal to give the keynote address, and afterwards, John Fund wrote a uh, editorial in the Wall Street Journal called The Future of the Canadian Peso. <laughs> and, it was so influential that the Canadian dollar fell three and a half cents that day. But what was the reaction? The Prime Minister of Canada gathered together his cabinet and said, enough is enough, and we are going to change things. As a result, according to uh, the Fraser Institute's Economic Freedom Index, the Heritage Freedom Index, Canada has gradually turned things around where, where government as a percent of GDP is dropped from 53% to 40%. The Canadian dollar is as strong as it's ever been. They, and they did it by reducing the deficit. In fact, they eliminated the deficit until the financial crisis. And they were able to do it without raising taxes. So my question to all of you is, realistically, can we imitate Canada in reversing this trend? And then specifically, again, three minutes, what is each of your organizations doing? Tell us a little bit about your organizations and what you are doing to return freedom to this country. Three minutes. Well, it is easier to turn something around uh, in a parliamentary country where you, you get a majority of one house and you can do pretty much anything you please. Uh, that is why Canada moved to the left much faster than the United States did, um, and that is why it might be easier to turn it, uh, to turn it around. Um, so I hope that answers uh, that aspect of it. Among the millions of newly activated grassroots conservatives and classical liberals in politics, 
thousands of the best are coming to my Leadership Institute to study how to win. Uh, my staff and our volunteer faculty are teaching now at dozens of Institute political training programs across America, co-sponsored separately by Tea Party Patriots, Tea Party Nation, Americans for Prosperity, Freedom Works, here today at Freedom Fest and many other grassroots organizations. On the 4th of July, we launched an online, on-demand, free offering of 12 activist training lectures for members of the Tea Party Patriots, uh, which, are, which is our first major project of this type. And my staff and I are working vigorously uh, with other grassroots groups to, to partner with uh, us at the Leadership Institute to provide online training for their people. Very good. And what's the website? Tea Party Patriot, no, excuse me, Tea Party Training dot org. Tea Party Training dot org. You have to be a member of Tea Party Patriots uh, to get the free training, but all to become a member, all you have to do is give them your email address. Now, Richard Vigory, you are the guru of political marketing. What are you doing in this regard? Well, uh, I'm doing a fraction of what uh, Morton is doing, but we are producing DVDs uh, to help Tea Party uh, groups around the country, conservative organizations, uh, uh, help start their organizations, give them legal advice, uh, public relations advice, uh, how to raise money. Uh, is uh, To quote my friend Morton Blackwell, uh, what people want to hear today is the sound of the cannons and smell the gunpowder. And if you're interested in uh, running an organization, starting one, there's no better time in the history of uh, the 20th century, certainly the 21st century, to start uh, conservative organizations at the local level, state level, uh, national level. And uh, one of the nice, not nice, it's exciting things about the Tea Party people and the new conservative organizations, to quote Reagan, uh, paraphrase Reagan from 76, he said, we need new leadership unfettered by old ties and old relationships. And that's uh, so true of the Tea Party people. They are unfettered, untied to these uh, uh, Republican operatives that have brought us uh, to rack and ruin. We didn't uh, lose the Congress, the Republicans didn't in 06, the White House in 08 having nothing to do with Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, Barack Obama had everything to do with the uh, failed, in my opinion, corrupt Republican leadership. So uh, we need to operate though. Yeah. One, one last point, Mark. Yeah. If you want to uh, see the socialist or worse uh, govern America for the rest of your life, uh, just uh, uh, operate in the third party arena and guarantee the election of Democrats and you'll never see the light of freedom uh, in your lifetime. Very good. Now, Steve Forbes, publisher, CEO, editor in chief of Forbes Inc., one of the most prestigious uh, magazines in the country, has over a million uh, readers. Um, are you, do you have political, uh, do you make political statements other than your editorial page? What kind of things are you doing to, uh, to fight for freedom uh, with the juggernaut you have called Forbes, Inc.? Um, well, it's a lonely juggernaut. Um, I think the Wall Street Journal, Investors Business Daily, Fox, and a couple of others, and that's it. But the nice thing is, Mark, we live in an age where technology has obliterated all the traditional bounds of media. And you can uh, put together, and that's why the Tea Party movement has been so effective, you can put together organizations, groups, immediately communicate in ways that were not possible in times past. So the monopoly of uh, three major networks is over. Uh, talk radio is uh, totally liberated. The attempts to muzzle them have failed. And uh, the internet is wide open. And the thing, though, I think we have to uh, keep in mind is that even if it seems unrealistic to do some of the things that we have proposed, if we don't propose seemingly unrealistic things, they will never become part of the mainstream. I cite again my home state of New Jersey, where they just passed a budget through a Democrat legislature that is actually truly lower than it was five years ago. That would have been impossible six or 12 months ago. So aim high. 
even the tax cuts of 2003, uh, reducing, say, the dividend tax uh, from 40% uh, down to 15%, personal uh, dividend taxes. If the administration hadn't proposed getting rid of the dividend tax, it would have gone from about 30, 40 uh, to maybe 34. So aim high, and uh, then you have a chance to achieve things and uh, occupy that high moral ground. Uh, whether it's a currency, the dollar, you earn a dollar, that should be a dollar today, tomorrow, and forever. Why should politicians muck around with it on Social Security? Why should your personal accounts be in the hands of Washington politicians? Knock on these things. Free enterprise and health care. One of the things we have to get over is this austerity trap where we're seen as the people who take away the fruit bowl and uh, say grandma must wait till 88 to get Social Security. No, we are the liberators. And when you reform the tax code, people love that. When you give people personal accounts and Social Security, that is popular. When you pe give people more control over their health care, that is popular. So uh, put the Democrats being in the area of uh, the uh, uh, Scrooge, the bad Scrooge, not the Scrooge uh, that uh, uh, our uh, Fred, uh, friend Chip likes, uh, but the uh, Scrooge of uh, Dickens, who uh, was seen as the uh, caricature of a uh, free enterprise. Let the Democrats be the naysayers. Let the Democrats tell us we are being unrealistic. No, we'll say we are the liberators. We trust you, not the Washington politicians. And we will win. And the key thing is I work with organizations like Freedom Works and others, and uh, putting these structures together will guarantee, even after an election, even if the candidate would wish to forget you, you won't let them forget you. And that's going to be key. And that's what Ronald Reagan did not have in the 1980s, this kind of national grassroots infrastructure of the scale that we have today. Uh, that wasn't there then. Now it is. And so uh, this thing won't be just a uh, tempest in a teapot or teacup. Uh, this will be a true revolution where we can put in structures, as our founders did uh, centuries ago, that get beyond the emotions of the moment but make sure we have institutions durable ones that will make sure this revolution is long lived and not just the flash in the pan. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> hey, Governor Johnson, have you studied the Canadian turnaround story and what lessons can we learn from that? Is there any way to really engage in any kind of radical surgery and still make that popular? How is that possible to tell people you're going to cut back on Social Security and Medicare the Americans are benefit corrupted. How do you do that without, and still win a campaign? Well, a, a year ago, I find myself outraged. I find myself outraged over the fact that we're bankrupt. And of course, we're bankrupt because we're printing 43, we're borrowing 43 cents out of every dollar that we're currently spending. And I find myself outraged over that. So I form our America initiative to try and put a voice to all this. The fact that we need to slash spending, that we need to cut taxes. That when you want to look at spending, well, what sh how much spending should we cut? Well, uh, 43 percent. That would just get us. Uh, <laughs> that would just get us level with expenditures and revenues. Is that possible? Is that realistic? Um, not really. But is there a sentiment to make this happen or to get us moving in the right direction? I, I see this as analogous to a super tanker. Look, you want to turn a super tanker around? What is it, eight miles to turn a super tanker around? So first you got to stop the engines or turn them into reverse. Once you turn the engines into reverse on a super tanker, it still takes eight miles to turn around. But if we can start that process, and I'm so actually make a difference, that we could actually make a difference. And if we actually started to make a difference, if we actually started to cut back, markets would see this. Markets would see this. Markets would respond. It would be positive. Confidence would return to individuals. When, confident, when people have confidence, they buy things. And when people buy things, businesses expand for the, because, because goods and services, there are more goods and services uh, demanded of them. So uh, I, I had two courses of action last summer. One was to lay on the couch and theorize uh, about what was possible. The other was to actually burn a little shoe leather and see if this could actually take place. There isn't a they out there that's going to come to the rescue here on this. There's there really, there's you and there's me, and I'm optimistic that we can really make this happen. I mean, again, start this process, but it can be done and it can be done now. Very good. <clears throat>
Now, and, and Tom, by, you... by, by the way, by the way, Mark, on this, when we say cuts, it makes it again sound like that we're taking things away. No, we're giving things back to people. And in healthcare, restructuring the way healthcare is done in this country, if we stay the, the keep the kind of system we have today, it will go crashing over the cliff. But if you allow more free enterprise, where people produce more health care, as they do everywhere else, I mean food. What, as I mentioned on Thursday, what's the food crisis in this country? We have too much of it. We eat too much of it. If government was in charge of it, we'd all be starving to get death. And so that's in health care. Producing more health care, you're not going to be taking anything away from grandma or people who are in tightened straits for the moment. They're going to get more at more affordable cost producing more like we do with food, we can do it with health care. That's the key thing to keep in mind, not cutting back, producing more at more cheaper prices like we do everything else. Very good. Uh, Tom, uh, tell us a little bit about the growth of the Mises Institute and your involvement with it, and then I'd like to switch the subject a little bit to your book, Meltdown, and give us a postscript of what's happened since then, because this financial crisis is still ongoing, and we haven't talked about that. That's a still a serious problem. So two aspects to your answer. Okay, sure. Well, the Ludwig von Mises Institute, where it's been a privilege of mine to be a senior fellow for four years, is dedicated to educating the general public in sound economics. We dream of a world in which professors, as they walk into their classroom, when they intend to teach only Keynesian claptrap and not give any alternatives, tremble as they go out into the classroom because they know the room is going to be filled with sharp young kids who know the rebuttals and who know Austrian business cycle theory. And we'll ask them, well, gee, maybe did the Federal Reserve have a, have a little teensy-weensy bit to do with why we had a housing bubble? In other words, that the classroom will be filled with kids who know the questions to ask. We're now at a position where investment guys all over the place, yeah, sure, of course I know the Austrian theory of the business cycle. That's the kind of world we need to live in if we're going to have any success. The general public has to know. I think the Mises website, M-I-S-E-S.org, is the most incredible website I've ever seen. You've got hundreds or thousands of hours of free audio, free video, entire courses, thousands of books in full, full text, including your book that you edited on Keynes is there available. Um, we have all of Human Action, Mises' book, Human Action. You don't want to read that online. We have it all on audiobook for free, for free. You can listen to Mises' Human Action. So no more excuses. Oh, I'd never have time to read it. German yes, accent. Yes, you will. Just drive to Germany, you know, <laughs> and come back. But you know, just get over the water somehow. So anyway, so it's, it's, it's quite extraordinary, and I urge people to go to uh, Mises.org. And people who are interested in Austrian economics, learn AustrianEconomics.com quick way to get, you know, what you should be uh, looking at. Now, in terms of the postscript to meltdown, that's what I talked about last year when I was here at Freedom Fest. I had the uh, privilege of speaking about meltdown, this book I wrote about the, the financial crisis, because I, I was afraid that there would be a whole bunch of books that would attribute the crisis to exactly the wrong causes, and this would, of course, poison our ability to get out of it. Well, I wasn't disappointed. That is, uh, by and large, what we got. Um, but still, there is much more interest in let's say, unorthodox points of view, like the Austrian point of view, precisely because the orthodox point of view is viewed as being, if not discredited, then having an awful lot of explaining to do. So since then, we've gotten a lot of, of uh, I've gotten a lot of favorable feedback on this, mainstream, very good reviews. I would say the government and the Fed have by and large done what I sort of would have expected them to do since then, but at least there is now a body of opinion that is critical of monetary policy in a way that really wasn't 10 years ago, and that's in advance. All right, let's ask each one of our panelists now. Our conference is in the greatest libertarian city in the United States. It's in Las Vegas. And what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, so we won't tell what, what you're all about to reveal. What did you do last night? No. <laughs> well, uh... No, wait a minute. I'm not finished with the question. Oh! <laughs> you do want to reveal what you did last night at 12 midnight? <laughs> I was well asleep at then, but, oh. but I can tell you more interesting stuff about earlier times. Um, but if you were a betting man, and here we're in Gamble City, 
what are your, you, you know, you talked about your optimism and so forth. So what are the chances that any of these particular um, policy recommendations, let's just take a tax cut, for example. Is there any chance of any kind of tax cut of any sort? If you were a betting man, would you bet money, real money, um, that we would have a tax cut of any sort in the next year? Let's just go down the line, just by a show of hands. And who would say, yes, yeah, we will sure. see a tax cut sure. in the next year? It depends, Mark, how you define tax cut, uh, oh. the real way or the Obama way. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Some people may get a tax cut. That's right. Now, how many of you are a betting man would say it's likely that the Bush tax cuts will not be renewed and that we will see an increase in tax rates in the next year? Show of hands. All right. See, Mark, I thought you is, guys were all optimists. This is why I like to be a historian. I never have to predict. I'm always right talking about the past. <laughs> all right. How about this? Uh, betting man that the Republicans will take control of both the House and the Senate in November. I followed closely enough to know. <laughs> Halfway. I don't know. See, now we're finding out where the real optimism is or the real pessimism is, you see. Tom, I notice you haven't raised your hand in either case. I just don't know. I mean, the, the world is so hard to predict these days. Like, there are things that I couldn't have imagined would happen a couple years ago that have happened, so I just give up trying to predict. All right. Well, Mark, you uh, should remember a favorite saying of my grandfather, an immigrant, penniless immigrant to this country, who started our company. When he started Forbes, he would be asked about things like interest rates, the economy, things like that, and you would always respond, you make more money selling the advice than following it. So, uh. <laughs> Mark, let, let me comment on, on this in, right. a, in, in a little more detail. Conservatives and classical liberals have it in our power to use the Republican Party now to build a stable governing majority. Content-free Republicans will not be persuaded by sweet reason to change their ways, nor will many of them change for fear of future defeats by people like us. Many of the content-free Republican elected officials and party officials will have to be removed and replaced before that party can be reliable for its avowed principle. Re Re Republicans made big mistakes in the last decade, particularly regarding big spending and government growth, and they'd better not look like Obama light after the 2010 elections. And if they do, grassroots activists will promptly turn against them, which would produce devastating effects in the 2012 election. The uh, Richard. When, uh, conservatives are like the, uh, the biblical Jews who had to wander through the desert for 40 years until that generation of failed and flawed leaders had passed from the scene. And conservatives are not gonna get to the political promised land until we get rid of this present Republican leadership. It just has got to go. And, uh, and I, uh, I think that uh, we're gonna have a, a big uh, win this year for, for Republicans, but it's just the beginning. It's gonna take you know, decades to turn this thing around. All right, show uh, Gary quickly. Well, just and I got another question. my optimism goes out a bit further. Rather than uh, these upcoming elections, I think when you look out to 2012 and 2014, it becomes much more optimistic, as I do see a continuation in what we're currently doing. All right, so question: A year from now, how many show of hands? We will. We, our troops will start withdrawing from Afghanistan. Show of hands. I thought you guys were optimists. What, what is this? Yeah, they'll be withdrawing under the, uh, in a way that's going to hurt our interests, not help them, uh, the way this man's operating. Are, are all of you opposed to the war in the Middle East? And how many, which of you would actually favor immediate withdrawal of all of our American troops from the Middle East? <laughs> Two. Uh, we, we might have a little difference of opinion here. Uh, well, there's we, a difference, Mark, between immediate withdrawal and phased withdrawal sooner than later. There's a difference there. I, uh, how many our, of you heard, by the way, yeah. Greg Mortensen's talk? How many of you heard Greg Mortensen's talk? I mean, he says his latest book, uh, Stones Into Schools, uh, How to Fight the War on Terror with Books, Not Bombs, and talking about education and all of these sort of things. 
I mean, I thought it was a very powerful message, uh, but you'd say we can't, we can't do it. We can't withdraw. We, we would leave a vacuum. Um, in, in, the, in those two countries, regimes which are not going to host efforts for terrorist massacres in the United States. Our interest is not in nation building. Well said. No disagreement. So, Gary, you have uh, expressed very strong opinions regarding war. What, what is your foreign policy? Well, I, I wouldn't disagree that we, we need to keep a vigilant eye on, on uh, an enemy that would point a weapon at the United States and potentially pull that trigger. Well, I would just argue that uh, that security is not being threatened in either Iraq or Afghanistan. I thought initially our uh, foray into Afghanistan was completely warranted. I thought that was about Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, but they're not there anymore. And I thought that before we went into Iraq, I thought that we had the military surveillance capability to see them roll out any weapons of mass destruction. We could have gone in and dealt with that uh, if, if, in fact, that happened. And I felt we'd become engaged in a civil war to which there would be no end if we got involved in Iraq. I, I just think we're borrowing 43 cents out of every dollar that we're spending. We're building roads, schools, bridges, highways, and hospitals in Iraq and Afghanistan. Don't we have those same needs here at home? Tom. Yeah, I, I was amused by the fact that John McCain criticized Barack Obama for spending $3 million to build a planetarium in Chicago. $3 million is what they spend every second and a half on these wars, right? And, and regardless of where you stand on the war on terror and all that, obviously this has nothing to do with Saddam Hussein. I mean, we all know that now. Any Middle East expert could have told you that. But what instead we've done, I mean, it's not just a matter of U.S. interests, U.S. interests. There's a moral dimension to this, and it is not a leftist thing to be concerned about mass murder. And frankly, when you are engaged in a foreign policy like this, when there are no grounds for it, and don't give me the, oh, the intelligence told us, come on. And you are leading to, at a conservative estimate, 50,000 deaths, 4 million people displaced. I'm so, you can't do that. You just can't do that. And, and, and beyond that, let's suppose there was a terrorist cell in Chicago. Would we bomb Chicago? <laughs> or would we figure something out? Could you choose a different city? <laughs> uh. You know, the most, uh, salient, the most salient fact, I thought, in, in uh, Greg Mortensen's speech, and, and by the way, he's agreed to come back next year. We're really excited about having him come. He's, he's really caught the vision of Freedom Fest, and, and I'm actually surprised that the libertarians and the conservatives have really not, I mean, from what I understand, this is the first time Greg Mortensen has spoken to a, a freedom organization, and, and he, his message is surely free. But it shocked me when he said, we have, we have 10 times the troops of the Taliban. Talibans have 20, 25,000 in Afghanistan, and we have 100,000 troops. I mean, and, and, and we, can't, we can't beat them, you know? I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. Uh, concerning uh, Tom uh, Chicago, are you talking about the city or the machine? <laughs> Very well put. We, we, we could do a surgical strike, if you understand. That's what I'm getting at. <laughs> well, if, if Mayor Daley were, were organizing terrorist uh, strikes and massacres in the rest of the United States, we would surely overturn his government in Chicago. Indeed, we would. Uh, but, I want to, Steve, but, but, you Mark, but Mark, just one thing in, uh, in terms of fighting insurgencies. There are right ways to do them and wrong ways. And I just recommend, in terms of uh, fighting insurgencies, to read people like Max Boot, who has examined many of these on uh, what, what, what has worked and what hasn't worked. And well, the ones that do work, you do have a very strong presence on the ground with people like Greg. Uh, the Philippine insurrection, put aside for a moment whether we should have gone in the Philippines after the war in 1898. We did, and uh, an insurrection broke out, but the way the U.S. won that one was uh, it went out in the countryside, worked in the villages, and that's how we got the word boondocks. It's a corruption of a Filipino word going out in the countryside and winning it there. So we've done these things before. Vietnam was not done the right way. The Philippines, in a narrow sense, was. So I think we have to look, if we decide to go in somewhere, the right ways to do it, and 
the right way is, includes working very closely with the people on the ground, because if you get their support, you can win. If you don't, it ain't going to work. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to present each one of our panelists with the symbol of Freedom Fest, and uh, each one of them will get a 2010 uh, American Eagle Silver Dollar for your appearance. And I'm very pleased that on the uh, front of the American Eagle Silver Dollar, which, by the way, continues to increase in value versus the other paper dollar that continues to lose value, it has the symbol of America, Benjamin Franklin's favorite symbol of America, the rising sun. So each one of you get one of those. And let us thank our panel but, for, but for a wonderful presentation. Uh, and uh, before you all leave, I want to mention in your packet.